the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show. Today, coming to you from Rasta Cowboy Records in beautiful downtown Tustin, California with Andy Gill and John Jailer Sterry of Gang of Four. Andy, what was your original motivation for forming Gang of Four? At the time, uh, um, John King and I were just kind of messing around. Um, I'd, you know, playing stuff on, I'd be playing stuff on the guitar. I mean, and it was almost like just kind of fooling around a bit with it, kind of nothing really serious. And then I think uh, we had we did a trip to New York in '76, and uh, and I was um, we were staying with a friend of ours called Mary Harron, who was uh, a journalist uh, for I think it was called New York Punk Magazine. Um, she later, much later, directed uh, American Psycho. Um, but at the time, she was like very connected with all the New York uh, scene, and she'd take you know. So a lot of nights we just go and hang out at CBGBs, not particularly to see anything, but we just sort of hang out at the bar with uh, Joey Ramone and John Cale and people like that, and just like have a beer and chat and stuff. And I think it was the f it was that kind of realization of how, how it was all a bit normal and it there's uh, these people weren't uh, on a pedestal and they weren't uh, out of touch that just they were normal joes and uh, i think that kind of impressed on me anybody can do this you know if you've got some ideas you don't have to be somehow super talented you don't have to be a virtuoso if you've got some ideas, you can do stuff, you know, and I think that was a bit of an inspiration. So when we came back to Leeds, we kind of was like, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's write some proper songs now and stop fooling around and uh, took it from there. Your debut album, Entertainment, celebrates its 40 year anniversary this year. How has your perception of the world and humanity changed in that 40 years? Well, that's a bit tricky. Um, I think um, the only way to answer that really is if you sort of look at the songs like over those 40 years because they're a reflection of how uh, I and to a certain extent John King uh, you know look at the look at the world in general all I'd say beyond that is I think I, I possibly thought in the 70s that there would be a sort of progress uh, through the 80s and the 90s and beyond that the world would become a fairer place and uh, racism would somehow disappear, gender inequality likewise. Uh, <clears throat> but that's not quite the way it's turned out. Why was it important to name Gang of Four after a faction of the Chinese Communist Party cited for their abuse of power during the Cultural Revolution of 66 to 76? It wasn't important to name it after them, mm -hmm. but... Uh, what was attractive about it was the way that it was expressed by the Chinese authorities uh, was that they were cultural traitors in a way and so I, quite, I kind of liked the idea that we might be cultural traitors in the sense that we didn't uphold the status quo but we were traitors to that status quo I liked that idea on the one hand I also liked the preposterous idea of kind of naming for you know for white kids you know at, uh, students after this incredibly powerful Chinese mini elite you know it's kind of like a bit preposterous what did the name gang of four mean to you I kind of I found out about the band sort of um by virtue of the fact that a lot of the bands I was listening to when I was sort of uh, 15, 16 were influenced by a Gang of Four, that kind of um, sort of like angular kind of jangly kind of indie stuff that came came about at that time. Um, so after doing like, you know, like a little bit of research as to what the influences were of those bands, that's how I found Gang of Four and all that kind of uh, post-punk era band. So um, yeah, so that was a springboard into that kind of world of music because you always want to look at uh, what come before, what come before that. 
so that was how I kind of uh, found out about Gang of Four. So what was in Excess front man, Michael Hutchins' state of mind during the writing and recording of his solo album that you co-wrote, produced, and engineered in 1997? His state of mind was, uh, you know, perfectly, he, he was himself. I mean, it, it was perfectly normal. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I worked with him for, for a couple of years and he was a great friend and I really, really, we really liked each other. Uh, and, you know, and we worked very well together. Uh, and uh, as you say, I mean, we, you know, we we set up a studio. I mean, I set up a studio in one of the bedrooms in uh, in the south of France. That, you know, and uh, I just, I had my computer set up and guitars and basses and keyboards and I'd, put together the music with kind of loops and stuff um and then <clears throat> he'd sing he'd sing on it and we just worked together on it um i mean we you know it's we used to kind of go and party with you two uh, now and then d down the road at um where bono and edge had a house and uh but we worked very hard and and one of the things that impressed me about Michael was uh, how hard he worked so you know he'd uh, if I didn't get out of bed in the morning he'd come and bang on my door and say come on we've got to work and uh, you know and also he'd he'd be very he'd work at it and work at it you know on, on looking for the the right words the right melody uh, and I remember on one occasion we we'd worked all afternoon and got a really great uh, version of the whole thing down and then he said uh, right okay we've done that I'm going to try it a completely different way I thought, oh god you know it's like why and then we did it differently totally differently totally different melody and uh, but it was also really brilliant and I think we ended up using bits of both you know in the song but so his his kind of work ethic was totally there you know to be absolutely honest I think he felt frustrated uh, carrying, you know, doing the in excess thing. I think he was felt kind of a bit beyond that at that point. Um, but they'd t they'd all taken money to do in excess tours, and they kind of had to do them. And I think he felt a bit trapped. Uh, that's kind of all I could say about that, really. Why did you feel that after recording Bono's vocals as a duet on Michael's song, Slide Away, was it not only your farewell to Michael, but also to Bono? I didn't say that. I didn't say it was a farewell to Bono. Uh, I, what, I, what I think I said was that it was a sort of a final farewell from me and Bono to Michael. Oh. That's, what, that's, that's mm. what, what it was. In a way, it was a bit of closure because that song called Slide Away and uh, the A&R guy from V2 uh, listen to all the things and say, oh, this, this song's amazing, uh, you've got to finish this off. And I was like, yeah, but we only have this amount of Michael's vocals. Uh, he said, yeah, but you've got to finish it off. How am I going to do that? Uh, <clears throat> and I said, well, the only thing I can think of is maybe if Bono came along and did some more vocals on it. And I kind of, so I, I, I worked out a middle eight for it and another verse. And so it's quite an interesting song in its own right, you know, it, it starts one way, goes to a chorus, then it goes off into this different thing. And it's quite an interesting song and um, quite moving. There's stories of you guys partying with Kate Moss and Johnny Depp, hanging out with Naomi Campbell, Helena Christensen uh, out by the pool. Um, was, that, was that world lost on you or, or did you accept it at the time that you were working with Michael? Well, it was part of, I mean, it, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of his world, uh, you know, um, and, uh, yeah, it was, uh, that's, that's what kind of what came with, uh, came with, with, with Michael in a way, you know, but I mean, I, I remain in touch with and friendly with Bono, um, don't see much of Helena these days. And what about Kate? She's an icon now. Yes, um, I bumped into her the other day because she was um, with what's his name from Kills. Uh, Jamie Hintz. Yes, 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 Jamie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah, I don't know how he scored that. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Why did John King exit Gang of Four in 2012? Well, John, I think, has always been a bit in and out. You know, I mean, it's not the first time. He kind of like, oh, you know, I'm going to go and do something else now. And so, okay. All right. um, a couple of times it was a bit annoying. Like, for example, in the mid-90s, just before I worked with Michael Hutchins, uh, I'd... Uh, we'd written, it's been a long time writing an album called Shrink Wrapped and I was literally just mixing it and he's and uh, just finishing off the mixes and he said, oh, I'm going to work in the advertising industry I was, sorry what? and uh, he said that, oh, yeah, I'm going to go and work in the advertising industry so that was in the mid 90s and then of course much more recently uh very similar thing. Uh, we're going to do an album. I did the album content. Shortly after that, it's like, okay, I'm done now. I'm off. It's like, okay, all right. I'm getting a bit fed up with this because it's like, if you if you spend a lot of time working on an album, you expect to go and tour it. Uh, so if that doesn't happen, uh, you you're kind of not even doing half the job. So, so he was off at that point, and um, but I, you know, and I said, I'm, well, I, I'm going to um, carry on with Gang of Four, and uh, and we did various things, various people. Um, talking of the Kills, Alison Mossart came and sang on something. Herbert Grunemeyer sang on something. Uh, various different guest artists and Jayla came and sang on some stuff and I thought it was really good We carried on from there. Jailer, how'd you end up in the studio with Gang of Four? I was just hanging around in London in the scene, you know, doing uh, I was in bands um, Playing all over and I think it was something to do with uh, like mutual management companies or something like that Anyway, I, I was invited down to the studio to do some um, Just kind of to hang out and do a little bit of backing vocals on something that Andy was producing kind of just didn't really know what you know what to expect whether it was like any kind of commitment or anything like that started doing it we got on really well and then um had a couple of tours booked and i think it just sort of went from there really i did, did those tours and then just sort of don't even re really remember having a conversation too no, much about no. it it just sort of happened pretty uh happened like anything else happens you know what was your confidence level going into the project well i know i mean i knew i could sing i'd done it f i've been in band since the age of about 15. So it's kind of what I did, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just a different way of working. It was, it was working very much with Andy being um, doing the producer role. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of uh, working out what my role would be in that. Mm -hmm. And then um, obviously the live stuff. I mean, I just I don't know. I just it just sort of happened. I mean, I'd done I'd done plenty of live shows before. This was just um, I guess it was a you know a couple of steps up the ladder, absolutely. Um, but I just kind of went with it, really. I think I didn't, I, I personally didn't try and give it too much. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to like um, bound myself up with trying to be something that I'm not. I wanted to do my own thing and uh, I wanted to take my experiences and my um, personality and put it into that, that role. That's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to like, you know, get all wound up with, uh, with trying to be. Uh, John King. Yeah. Too. I mean, yeah. What's the, what's the point in that? You know, cause I'm not, so. So I just wanted to be me, and uh, I think that's important. The way the music business works now, it's pretty grueling to go out there and go on tour. So how has the touring been for you in the last, like, 10 years? Well, I'm not going to pretend that it's not, you know, it can be tiring, you know. And it, it, there's, you know, I mean, just a couple of days ago, we, we came in from London to LAX, uh, and that's pretty grueling. And then when we got here, we had to sit in the airplane for a couple of hours till they let us off. Uh, and then we had to do the visa thing, which was quite an experience. I think there was something like 700 people and two people actually stamping the passports. So it was just going on forever. And I just thought, I'm just going to die. This is, <laughs> this is just going to kill me. And uh, we just kind of... And then we had to do the get through uh, customs and all the rest of it. Um, so stuff like that is... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not even so much the shows. Like the shows you can kind of like because you can try and build your day around that so you're kind of firing on all cylinders when you get to the shows but yeah it's the other stuff it's the waiting around it's the traveling uh it's constantly lugging your suitcase around with you mm. um eating crap food that kind of stuff that's the thing that w is tiring but other than that i mean the shows because it's, it's it's something that we all enjoy you know we have to remember that it's something we 
always enjoyed so I, I don't have a problem with that what was the inspiration for the album cover to gang of force 2015 release what happens next and why the two towers that almost look like the twin towers on the cover if you know <clears throat> london at all it's the shard which is that pointy building mm -hmm. which is i don't know how old is the shard i don't know it's about six years old is that all Something like that. it's not very old. i think yeah it probably hadn't been up it was probably pretty new when that record was done and i was playing with some of the songs uh, are kind of london songs uh so the song isle of dogs on that record there is a part of london which kind of is on the thames which is called the isle of dogs uh and it's sort of a, a london song and to do with like uh the big banks and and the, the capital there and some of the more kind of sinister characters um so i felt that the record was a bit sort of a bit, a bit of a london thing um and i tried i tried all kinds of different images uh like trying to get images of london but in the end the, the more you narrow it down the more you crystallize it the the more you get it and so it ended up being the sort of the shard that pointed building mm. but it just seemed to work better with two of them uh, kind of reflecting each other in that rather murky gray sort of slightly unpleasant sinister industrial kind of look so it ends up being a, almost a duality because the buildings are pointed and then having two of them creates a pyramid going down and a pyramid going up which could be considered as above so below mm -hmm. type of good deeds outweighing bad deeds type of thing yeah, yeah I, think, I mean th that's i mean th that is something that um uh i think with songs and with imagery you don't always want to completely tie down the way the viewer is supposed to see it and i think and i, I like what you just said i mean I, you know the um that kind of interpretation is totally appropriate and you know, and um which is sometimes is why i hesitate to sort of over explain things because i don't want to narrow down the way people see it that much ambiguity is key always after you decided to have jailer in the band how important was his worldview and his political stance to you i think if we were coming from the same place it kind of wouldn't, wouldn't really work you know if, if we weren't more arguments on the tour bus put it that way yeah exactly i think we got on very well and our precise politics or whatever don't have to absolutely lock in um he's more left-wing than i am i think we look at th things in a, in a vaguely similar kind of way so that would have been quite important i mean it wouldn't kind of really work if it if there wasn't some sort of alignment at what point did you feel strongly that there was that alignment on that what happens next record you know i, I when i started it i didn't really know what, what was going to happen uh which is sort of partly the title but uh and at one point, I think I was thinking, oh, maybe this should be all collaborations. You know, Jamie Furs sang on it and uh, what the people we just talked about earlier. And um, But then it, Jayla kind of sang on some things. Um, he had been doing some backing vocals on a, a German project I've been producing. <clears throat> but then I thought, oh, we'll try singing this as well. And it's, he sang that and, you know, um, I, th I could see it was working and, and we, you know, we hang out together, talked about things, uh, did more singing. Uh, and then I think we actually did a little semi-secret gig in a pub just to try out what that would feel like for for me and for him and mm. Thomas. Do you remember that? Vaguely, yeah. I remember knocking over a pint on stage. Yeah. Not, not the not, last one. Not the last one. The first of many. Mm. And I, I expect you broke a mic stand and duffed in a microphone as well. That's what I you normally do. I did, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lexington it was. The Lexington, yeah. yes, that's quite right. And that was like a sort of, uh, this works. Some of the first gigs we did in the UK, there were a few comments like, oh, he's too young. A few people kind of expect me to only work with people of my age, you know, who are kind of going around on Zimmer frames. And, um, and I just think that's ridiculous, you know, it's like, you know, I work with people of whatever age, I don't care, you know, it's like, in fact, somebody reviewed, uh, not that long ago, reviewed a gig we did in Manchester, England, and said, arguably, Gang of Four is the best young band in Britain. 
which is kind of funny. Any way you slice it, when somebody's telling you that your singer or any member of your band is too young, you're dealing with people trying to control you. Well, that's true. And I also think there are still people out there, Stones fans, who think Ronnie Wood's not really a Stones, you know. <laughs> uh, you have to jump through so many hoops of authenticity, you know, um, for some people. Tell me what kind of education you're getting from Andy Gill. <sighs> question um It'd be embarrassing really. <laughs> i mean in terms of music thinking things through and not being afraid to remold things and remodel things a little bit because i think my initial um instinct with music is to sort of think well that was quick just get it out you know kind of that kind of thing you know if it feels right just do it but i think andy's approach is quite often to sort of analyze it a bit more and then sort of maybe pick it apart and put it back together and i think that's something that i've learned musically and being on the road you know i think just learning how to how to fucking cope with it really of which i'm a master obviously <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so what inspired the lyrics to the song first world citizen with gail ann dorsey on vocals off the what's happening next album funnily enough that song was written basically that song was written in um i think it was about 84 Five eighty-six, and uh, it had just been sitting on a tape somewhere uh, and then when I was doing What Happens Next uh, it kept the, the tune of it kept popping into my head and, and and I really liked the words and so I got it off tape we got it into we, we got it you know back in a, in, back into a computer and I don't think we actually used anything from the original but the song was there and lyrically it's kind of about immigration into America and, and people who come from much poorer backgrounds who are arriving in America and making a new life everything they had to go through to, in order to do that and in order to make that happen and it was kind of set in the post-war career and people coming from Korea and coming to America which so many did trying to imagine the, from what's inside the head of this Korean woman coming and what she's thinking and trying to make a good life here. Yeah, that's that's the basis of it. It was amazing having Gail sing on it. What inspired the lyrics to the song? She said, you made a thing of me off the 2011 album content. Yeah, I basically wrote all of that. Um, although John King chucked in a couple of words, but it, it was kind of analyzing a relationship. I was just looking at a man, a woman who are in a relationship and some of the things that they might have said to each other, uh, which is true of a lot of Gang of Four songs, uh, which are kind of almost like a mini play. And you try and get some sense of what this, it is like a mini play. Yeah, so you, you get some sense of what the man is thinking that he's doing and is supplying and what he wants from the woman. And then the woman is you know, doing the same thing, explaining what she thinks she's getting or with the way he's behaving or what she wants and those things so it's it's um it's like that well, highlights of working with allison mosshart on what happens next they did a tv series in the uk uh i think it was channel four and where they got musicians to come in or musicians that had some aptitude with producing to come in and produce various songs with various different acts and i so I did a couple of songs with The Kills, and I did a couple of songs with, they called Cage the Elephant. Yeah, I did a couple of songs with them, they were nice guys. And, and uh, that's how I met her. And we, were, you know, we got on well, and I knew she was quite into Gang of Four. So in this phase when I was thinking, oh, let's do collaborations. So I got her in. She was re really, really good. What makes her unique? Uh, she's a hard worker and she's, her artistic, her creativity kind of extends into a lot of different areas. She's a very good painter, actually. So Off Gang of Four's 2018 EP, Complicit, with Ivanka Trump on the cover, what was your motivation in writing and releasing Ivanka, Things You Can't Have? I don't like to be too, you know, I don't, with, with Gang of Four songs, uh, we don't particularly want to be taking particular issues, current affairs, issues of the day, try to avoid that in general but i think with the ivanka thing it was was a was a very special situation i think where president trump had got into the white house and one of the first things he does is stick his daughter in an office in the white house i remember some reporters shouting sir isn't this nepotism and he said what's wrong with nepotism and which is like an honest and frank answer and uh 
and then so it was like it almost felt like for a while she was going to be the fair-faced spokeswoman for philosophy of trump um so there was the, a kind of famous speech where someone said well surely you're complicit with uh, and she said i don't know what it means to be complicit uh, which is a great line and really it was just she was writing the song not me you know I just like took some quotes from the stuff that she'd said and put it on this track it's observational and descriptive and a bit funny but it, those are kind of her words without a huge amount of interpretation from me what do you think of Ivanka Trump aesthetically aesthetically um um You've got me completely stumped now. <laughs> uh, dubious fashion sense. If she wasn't Ivanka Trump, you wouldn't think she was a beautiful woman. Um, uh, she's definitely uh, she's definitely quite pretty. Yeah. Now, Jailer, what do you think of her? She's very. Um, well, she's that classic kind of uh, blonde hair. Kind of, um, she's got that kind of, you know, all American girl look. And I think maybe that's why she's been used in the way that she has. Does her husband scare you? Oh, Jared? Jared Kushner. <clears throat> he doesn't keep me awake at night, but um, I, I wouldn't trust him very much. What inspired the title of your new album, Happy Now? Oh, I don't know. It just popped out. You know, I think I had a little list and, um, and then one day I had the name had to be named and uh, I just went to the list and I'm happy now is good it kind of um, links on a little bit with what happens next like both of those um, phrases are both uh, quite ambiguous to use the word of the day mm. you know happy now could be in a kind of like well there's many many ways you can read it are you happy now no 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 me happy <sighs> no okay and jailer are you happy now? <sighs> Up and down. What inspired the lyrics of the song, Off Happy Now? We're going to start off with Alpha Male. That is sort of faintly referential. I mean, um, Donald does appear for momentarily in that song. It's kind of describing a, a sort of coterie of powerful people, a location where money and power and sex sort of come together this is imaginary a steam room with people sitting in there with their deep fake tans and rich old men beautiful young women and very powerful people so that's the kind of the setting for that song the donald makes a brief appearance that track's been kicking around musically for, for quite a long time ever felt like an alpha male Jailer? Um, only when I play soccer. What inspired, and again, you use Ivanka. Ivanka, my um, name's on yeah. it. It's almost a bit like a remix. It's, it's, it's faster. It's very similar. It's faster. The bass line's been changed, and the drum beat's different. Uh, there's a new verse in it. It's, it's kind of a rehash of the original. Um, but it's just got a few other bits in it. And, what and, and we've done a lovely video with uh, an Ivanka lookalike and i'm hoping to get that up pretty soon that was a surreal day i remember that when she turned up in the house could almost have been her mm. maybe it was your single paper thin mm. what inspired the lyrics the song kind of says it. it's like everything was solid but now it's all paper thin the information that we used to get from newspapers and stuff we kind of felt there would be we didn't believe everything but we knew that some of it would be fact checked some of it would be true uh, and things like that seem to have fallen away so nobody has any idea what, what information is, is uh, legitimate and which, what isn't. A lot of things have been questioned to the extent that we're not sure what we're holding on to anymore. How do you mentally and emotionally deal with that? I think everybody's in a sort of state of heightened anxiety because I think, I think this affects everybody I think, and I think it manifests itself. In Europe I think with fear and increased nationalism turning away from i mean i think the last great sort of immigration was when angela merkel let a load of people into germany you know about three years ago and since then everybody's turned their back on that concept uh so you know the european 
one of the noble aspirations of the European Union was the free movement of people. The gates are closing, you can almost hear them closing one after another. And that's also behind Brexit. And I think there's a, there's a general kind of anxiety going around at the moment. Do both of you feel that a one world government and a one world religion is the answer to the world's problems? No, I don't think that would help. And that, um, uh, I, I think that there's got to be a lot of freedom of, um, there's got to be a lot of freedom of choice and, and democracy is still the only kind of system that is uh, going to get anywhere. Was the bright bass tone starting with David Allen intentional or happenstance? You know, we wanted it to cut through. We wanted it to be really clear. I mean, one of my favorite bass players that's played with Gang of Four, uh, other than Thomas, was Gayland Dorsey. And she plays uh, with her fingers, and it's not particularly bright. And yet, uh, it also works incredibly well. You'd think it might not, because it's less percussive. But it totally works, so which is interesting, uh, and you know, and I think she's because she's uh, just an incredible musician. On Happy Now, there's a kind of more of a mixture of bits of synth bass interwoven with played bass that Thomas is playing. Highlights of working with bassist Sarah Lee from 1981 to 1983. She was very good. Steve Goulding was playing the drums. Sarah Lee on bass. We did a lot of touring of, of America, and she was a great bass player. What do you remember about producing the first Chili Peppers record? Was it comfortable for you? It was comfortable. I mean, it was funny, and there were some kind of weird moments. Anthony went missing for a few days and then came into the studio when uh, Jack Sherman was playing acoustic guitar on True Men Don't Kill Coyotes. Anthony came in, heard through the speakers, through the monitors, heard this acoustic guitar and said, what the hell is that? And so Jack's playing a strumming an acoustic guitar and he just burst in the room, took the, ripped the guitar from him, smashed it on the floor and came back in and just said, no acoustic guitar on my record. And, uh, and then walked out again. We didn't see it for another three days. So we had to go and buy another acoustic guitar and uh, you know, do it again. For you, how important are the accolades received by Rolling Stone magazine, Kurt Cobain, and St. Vincent? Well, it's nice. You know, it's nice to get pe people that you respect saying good things about you, that it's great stuff and it's been influential on them. I think it also draws a lot of people into Gang of Four that may have not known about Gang of Four otherwise, when they read stuff about people saying, oh, this is great, which is why when you come to a Gang of Four show, it's not all old guys like me. It's like a big age range of people that have come into it from all different eras. Jailer, what do you love most about the fans that you're meeting on the road? They're just very knowledgeable. They're knowledgeable about um, the band, the history of the band, the related bands and the music that, went, that was around at the time of the inception of Gang 4 and all the way through the, the history of it, all, all, the, all of the, um, the bands that Andy's produced, all that kind of stuff. They just have a very wide knowledge of music and it's just interesting to talk to, talk to them about tunes that they like, that kind of thing, you know. That's that's what I enjoy talking about. Are you living the dream right now? It's good fun, I've had worse jobs. What is your greatest extravagance? Expensive wine. Cars, I go through cars like hot dinners. What are some of the greatest adversities you guys have had to overcome to get where you are today? It's a hell of a lot of work and I don't think people uh, realize quite how much work it is, you know. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you can be a bit part-time about you know it's you've got to kind of throw yourself in there and you've got to deal with a hell of a lot of stuff when you get knocked down you have to get up again you know and uh <clears throat> if, if you want to keep going yeah same just that that thing of, of having to sort of throw yourself fully into it you know you can't um you can't really have too much of a safety net because if you do then you're never going to be hungry enough to try and make it work so that you know and, and because of that, you know, trying to trying to exist, um, being in bands when I was first starting out, and trying to live in London at the time, you know, you, you, I tried I tried uh, working and doing like you know, uh, five days a week. The, the the last thing you want to do is do anything creative, so you can't do that. So you have to just throw yourself in and just close your eyes and just hope it works. What is the most unselfish thing you've ever done for someone? I don't know. I, um, I'm probably quite selfish. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm capable of the occasional acts of kindness um, uh, and uh, 
I, I try to make sure the what I do is fair to uh, to everyone. I think that's uh, about as far as I can go mm. in terms of uh, unselfishness. <laughs> I don't know. I make a lot of cups of tea for people and um, don't expect them back. But I don't know whether that's because I want tea myself. So it kind of begs the question of whether a selfless act is actually a selfish act in disguise. You think that by giving people cups of tea, you're creating good karma for yourself? That, that might come back. Yeah, and also, like, you know, I don't want to deal with the fallout of making myself a cup of tea and no one else. Um, well, that's then that's rude. clearly selfish, isn't it? Yeah. Do you believe in a higher power? Being God? Uh, um... No, I, I, I don't believe in, in God. No, no, I don't. Uh, I don't think so. Not, especially not, definitely not a personal God. No. What has been your secret to not becoming a casualty to sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Who says I'm not a casualty? Everything in moderation. Um, just don't get offered it enough. You don't get offered it enough? No, I would if I could. Hey, what's next for you guys? Uh, well, we're playing tonight. First gig uh, uh, on this tour. Here, are we playing here in Tustin? Uh, and I'm looking forward to that quite a lot. Mm. Um, after all the travel and all the hassle, and oh my goodness, uh, it's really hard getting an American visa these days, and so expensive. Yeah, really? Oh, God, yeah, God, you wouldn't believe. It it's got harder and harder. Um, so yeah, so after all of that, we finally get to actually do the thing, which is what it's all about. But, uh, and then we're doing this American tour. Um, and uh, after that we, we, we're doing a couple of gigs in China a couple of gigs in uh, Japan and we're doing a tour of Australia and New Zealand now you've, you guys have toured China before what is it like there for you? well the, the audience is really uh, amazingly enthusiastic yeah, I mean it was one of the first tours you did wasn't it? it was the first tour I did yeah. Yeah. there's a big punk scene out there in Beijing that we, uh, we we went to a few shows out there didn't we and uh, mm. saw some bands some great stuff I think Andy's produced a couple of bands as well so it's, yeah. it's very fertile ground what kind of feedback do you get from them about your music and about Jailer I think one of the cool things is is uh, we'd never been to China before you know the first time Gang of Four went there was with him and and it was just it was an all round good experience you know it was uh I I had been there producing a band the previous year and that was when I kind of made contact with the various people and they said yeah well we'll have you come over. It's very down to earth. Thank yeah. you Andy. Yeah. Jailer, it's great having you on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show. The Blaring Out show.